trust that most of you thank you i trust that most of you visited uh my lecture last night and he doesn't need introduction but just for for those of you who who couldn't make it yesterday let me briefly uh introduce him uh he got his degrees from uh belgium university university de louvre if i pronounce it correctly uh and then in 1972 he moved uh to uh, our neighboring state uh university of wisconsin in in medicine and he remained there ever since uh he's a theoretical physicist a uh, notable theoretical physicist in uh particles and and high energy he's an author of a um, textbook which uh probably we're also using in our classes quarks and leptons which is by now almost 40 years old and still highly useful and uh and uh, uh in use um he despite of being a theoretical physicist he is a pi on a big project uh ice cube which is as close to neutrino astronomy as we ever came, as far as I could tell. And that will be a subject of his talk. Uh, he, he is a recipient of numerous prizes like Balzan Prize, European Physical Society Prize, uh, Bruno Pontecorvo Prize, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, that's probably it. It's all yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to visit my neighbors and uh, so here is the menu for today it's actually pretty straightforward i'm going to introduce to you the, co the concept of neutrino astronomy and why it exists and uh, then i'm going to describe the telescope ice cube and I'm going to tell you what we see coming from the universe. And then I will tell you that we finally, in the last two years, began to find sources of neutrinos in the cosmos. And I'll make a guess of what produces the cosmic rays. It's, a, it's still a guess, but uh, I want to you know, convince you that we have the tools now to solve the cosmic ray problem. That is the oldest problem in astronomy. They were discovered in uh, 1912. So the, my first slide, which is not coming up, that's, let me, yeah, okay. No. Ah, look. Hmm. Okay, so this is all the astronomy you have to know for this lecture. I know most of you are physicists. And uh, so this, what this plot shows is not the number of particles, but the energy in particles, that, in particles or in light that reaches us from the sky. So when you scan, you ask as a function of the frequency of the light or as the energy of the particles, how much energy do we detect at Earth reaching us from the universe? That's the answer. And most of the energy in the universe reaches in uh, the form of CMB photons. Uh, CMB photons, the 411 per cubic centimeter in the whole universe play a big role in this talk. Because remember, the universe isn't empty. And so all this radiation particles, they fill the universe. So it's not an empty place. And so then if you go to radio, so this is longer wavelength light, uh, there is less energy. If you go to bluer light, and you see here infrared, visible light, 
That's uh, the energy in X rays that reaches us from the universe. And here are the highest energy uh, form of light gamma rays that we detect from the sky. And then you see this stops. And then there is nothing. In fact, the highest energy that reaches us from the universe beyond this blue arrow is in terms of particles, not light, in terms of protons and, uh, and nuclei, but mostly protons. And so you, the reason you cannot do astronomy uh, with light is because you have a, an object like a galaxy far away that you try to observe, at these energies, the gamma ray will meet one of the CMB photons, one of the 411 per cubic centimeter, make an E plus E minus pair. And once you have charged particles, you cannot do astronomy. The universe is filled with magnetic fields. And even if they are weak, we don't know them very well. By the time these particles come into our galaxy, they are affected by the galactic magnetic field and they get uh, isotropized. So that's, of course, why we haven't solved the cosmic ray problem, because protons, these protons, they, uh, we detect them, but because of the magnetic field and the, because they are charged, they don't tell us where they come from, and you see pretty much uniform sky. So the idea is to do astronomy uh, with uh, neutrinos instead. Of course, neutrinos, they don't interact to first approximation. And uh, so you really literally collect, according to the standard model, Neutrinos reach you directly from the beginning of time and from the edge of the universe. So uh, you see the whole universe in neutrinos. And in fact, in 2013, that's the story I'm going to tell first, we did manage to see a flux of neutrinos from the universe. And this uh, I'll describe, that's its, uh, and you see that's its uh, spectrum. And you see, actually, it is higher than the flux of gamma rays, which you see indirectly, which is, uh, you know, shifted to these energies by the interaction in the microwave background. So this was a big surprise. You know, neutrinos, they're not, the first surprise was that, you know, there are not some esoteric particles coming from some unusual objects, they seem to dominate the sky at these energies. And then, of course, uh, uh, the question is, uh, how are you going to detect cosmic ray sources? Well, that's simple. There are two ways to look at this neutrino. The first way is that it's just like light. There's no difference, except for this minor fact that uh, it reaches us from everywhere without being attenuated, which is an advantage. Of course, it also means that it's very difficult to detect. Uh, the other way of looking at these neutrinos is you make neutrinos like at Fermilab, you can only make neutrinos with proton beams. So when you see a neutrino source, you don't have to worry, you're guaranteed is a cosmic, if you have discovered a cosmic ray source. So neutrinos map the sky in cosmic ray sources. Uh, so this is the other way to think about this. You see here the sky at various wavelengths again. And so this is the place where the light is absorbed. And so the rest of the universe we have never seen or never done astronomy. In. And so the idea of doing uh, astronomy with neutrinos at this high energy or very small wavelength, is uh, it's not a sign. You cannot tell you. Everybody invented it as soon as uh, the concept that the neutrino was real uh, originated in 1956. Of course, if you want to do this, you would like to have some motivation. And I tell you what my motivation was. In 1991, 
a small cosmic ray experiment in Utah discovered this particle that has 300 million TeV energy. And, you know, I think the idea is uh, that uh, you want to know how nature does this, right? The best we can do in Geneva is 14, 14 one four TeV. And if you fill the LHC, you fill the orbit of Mercury with LHC magnets, you accelerate that particle. But uh, yes, that's not how it happens. Uh, the cosmic ray spectrum, the cosmic ray problem is actually many problems. This is the number of cosmic rays reaching a detector as a function of their energy this time instead of the frequency. And there is cosmic ray physics that we kind of understand. These cosmic rays here come from the sun. The cosmic rays here, we know they come from outside our galaxy. We only know this recently because of the Auger experiment. So we don't know where they originate or, or how they are accelerated, but we know it's not in our own galaxy. The rest is uh, a puzzle. And so this is, uh, we are going to try to attack that puzzle in this region of energy where both the galaxy and extragalactic sources contribute. Now, the concept is simple. Uh, you know, there, I don't know how many theories there are to explain the cosmic rays. We just don't know which one is right, if any of them. But I only show you one, and you will see later in the talk why. This is an active galaxy. And this active galaxy, it has all galaxies have a, a, a supermassive black hole at their center. The fact that it's active refers to the fact that it's cannibalizing its own galaxy. So stars, gases, fields fall into the central black hole. And in this inflow of material, you somehow accelerate protons. And by the time this has been going on for a while, there are high concentrations of hydrogen and, uh, and light in this, close to this galaxy. So these protons are accelerated where there is a target to produce pions and to produce neutrinos. And in fact, uh, so the idea is you accelerate a proton and uh, the photons around surrounding the black hole can interact with a proton, produce a pion and charge pion, decay into a muon and a neutrino, and in the muon decays into an electron and two more neutrinos. And you will see we begin to suspect that this is actually happening very, very close to the central black hole, where uh, there are huge concentrations of X-rays. The astronomers tell us how many. And uh, there is also a huge concentration of, of gas. And in fact, uh, in the example I will discuss, uh, the neutrinos are produced on both. And they are produced very, very close to the black hole. So that's a totally common sense example of how you imagine uh, a cosmic accelerator. I already told you, it's just like at Fermilab, you take a proton beam shooting in target and uh, uh, you produce 1950s physics, charged pions by P gamma interactions. Remember in my example, the target may be gamma rays, uh, may be light. And, but you cannot have this and produce neutrinos without having this and produce gamma rays. The pi zero will decay into two gamma rays. So it's very simple. For every neutrino, there's a gamma ray with twice the energy. And so remember that. Uh, you can actually do this accounting on your fingers. Uh, a proton comes in. Remember, it's a cosmic ray source. It interacts with the gamma target, the pi zero makes two gamma rays. Here is the decay chain again for the pi plus. And you just count that the end products, there is a new mu and an anti-new mu bar 
voor toe gamma rays. Een ice cube kan al tel neutrinos voor manta neutrinos. So that means there are two neutrinos for two gamma rays, or one neutrino for every gamma ray. And except the gamma rays have twice the energy, because here the energy is subdivided in four. Here each gamma ray takes half of the pi on energy. Okay, so that's the concept of uh, neutrino astronomy. And the main motivation is really not astronomy, is to, for us, was to solve the cosmic ray problem. Of course, uh, how to detect neutrinos is uh, very well known. This is the biggest detector ever built in Japan. Uh, and 40 kiloton, you need water and photomultipliers. Now, the one thing I didn't tell you is how big a detector do you need to see this active galaxy? So, Literally for decades, theorists had been calculating, predicting the number of neutrinos from everything you can think of. Active galaxies, uh, gamma ray bursts, uh, clusters of galaxies, uh, pulsars, binary systems. And there was this uh, strange conversion that it didn't matter what theory you were doing you always end up like in the ballpark that you needed a, a kilometer cube neutrino detector to possibly see the, this, uh, what I just described. And so it was decided long ago, we were going to build a kilometer cube neutrino detector. So that means that this one is 10,000 10, times too small. Uh, how do you do that? This is 1960s physics. Markov at a conference in Rochester proposed the idea. And uh, the idea, I won't read it. Here you can see uh, what you do is you look for neutrinos coming through the Earth. Only neutrinos can come through the Earth. So you detect particles coming through the Earth without neutrinos. That makes it easy. It's actually not quite as easy. What does the neutrino do? It goes right through your detector, which may be, which Markov suggested was you go kilometers deep in the ocean and uh, deploy a lattice of light sensors or photomultiplier tubes. And so the neutrino will mostly go through this, but at the energies that we are working, it will interact with the nucleus of uh, hydrogen or oxygen atom in the water, about one in a million times. And when it does that, the neutrino disappears and makes charged particles. And once it's made charged particles, they interact with the water and uh, emit blue light, Cherenkov light, and then you can, you can observe the neutrino. So especially useful is if this is a muon neutrino, they come in three flavors, but This is our workhorse, this muon neutrino. And so it will produce a muon among these charged particles. And these muons travel in water uh, for kilometers, to up to 10 kilometers at high energy. So you can detect neutrinos outside the instrumented volume. You have to pay for instrumenting. And uh, the light it's emitted, the, these are high energy neutrinos, so this is a high energy muon, it used essentially at the speed of light, but the light it makes travels at three quarters of the speed of light. You have to take the index of refraction into account. And so it, it, out, it outruns the light it's emitted and makes a shock wave, a bow wave, like a, a bow. And so you measure the shape of that bow wave, it tells you where the muon comes from, Standard model physics says that high energy, these are aligned, certainly by the precision of the experiment. And you have a telescope because you don't only detect neutrinos, you see, you know where they come from. And uh, the critical thing to remember is, so if we do this at the South Pole, we are looking at the sky, the northern sky. Uh, all this is standard model physics. So that's the, the beauty. Uh, if uh, 
you know, we know all the physics by which this experiment works at every step. In the late, in the late uh, 1980s, we started developing in Madison the idea of uh, putting these photomultipliers in ice rather than, uh, than in water. In fact, this was being tried in various places in the world, and these experiments were not doing well. And this is the only thing we really take credit for. The rest was a lot of luck. But we, we actually envisaged that put going to the South Pole and putting these photomultipliers a mile deep in ice was simpler than putting them four kilometers deep in ocean water. And so history has proven us right. So, but uh, you know, the idea is to use uh, this uh, uh, the ice as a particle detector. But nobody actually knew whether this was possible, because you know, usually you are very careful when you design a detector what the optical quality is for blue light in this case, and nobody had ever seen the eyes we, are, we were going to instrument. Uh, but here is the good news. That's a picture of a real event. So this is the detector. If you look very carefully, you will see that along this string, this white light, there are little dots. And each of these little dots is a, is a photomultiplier. And here the neut a neutrino comes in, it interacts. Here's the muon making light going at the speed of light through the detector. And you see it deposits, we measure that it deposits 2,600 TV in the detector. And that is high enough energy that this neutrino cannot be produced in the atmosphere which is part of our problem. Because you do astronomy, uh, you look up in the sky or you look down through the Earth, in the atmosphere, everywhere around the Earth, cosmic rays will produce neutrinos and muons. Not just neutrinos, but also muons in huge numbers. So it's as if you have doing astronomy, and have dark clouds above your head or below your feet. And you have to look through them. And uh, it's a problem of catching one interesting neutrino for every 10 to the 9 neutrinos that you identify. Ah, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, no, no, I'm coming to that. So one second. Here it is. I'm going to show you the movie. This is actually the online display of the experiment. So the energy is high enough that we are sure that this is a cosmic neutrino. Of course, you don't, this is an extreme case. The energy scale is red to green to blue. You follow the rainbow, right? And so that gives you the time. The size of the events is how many photons are detected by each photomultiplier. So we know. We, we get a detailed trace from every photomultiplier counting all the photons as a function of time. So if you go inside the detector, it is of course a cartoon, you will see this string a kilometer long. So at the top, you are one and a half kilometers below the geographic South Pole. Then you have one kilometer instrumented, and then it's another 500 meters to the bedrock. So 60 uh, photomul 10 inch photomultipliers per string. You go 125 meters away, there's another string. 125 meters away, another one. You make an hexagonal pattern, and that instrument, a kilometer cube of ice, which is what you want to do. And so uh, this is an optical, uh, what we call a digital optical module. I will not go in much detail on this. So it's a 
Hamamatsu ten inch photomultiplier in a pressure vessel, which is glass about a centimeter thick to protect the photomultiplier when the ice refreezes around it. And uh, here you have a digital board that uh, will capture the signal that comes out of the photomultiplier. Uh, you have, we have two chips and a flash ADC that captures the light signal. And then the light signal is digitized and send up to the surface over the same cable that brings down the voltage. So it's a very simple system. And um, so this is the type of, so there is no ice cube actually. There are 5,160 optical sensors filling this kilometer cube. And you see, whenever one detects light, it, uh, it detects it is detects the cyst the, the the number it counts the number of photons and then it sends the digital picture you see there to the surface to computers and the computers in real time collect the digital signals from all of these optical modules and then puts them together in this image you saw it puts them together in image in uh, patterns that are correspond to to neutrinos it's a very simple uh, system. Here you see that's one year, uh, two months. It's warm enough at the South Pole to deploy the equipment. So you see 20 cables, and they go into this two-story building. And this two-story building has the computers that in real time reconstructs the neutrino events. Yes. Well, the short the short answer is that they did this starting before us, and we did it, and we ended up doing it fifteen years earlier. the The real answer is that uh, you you asked it a bit too early, but uh, when you put this uh, this sensitive equipment in water, it undergoes temperature difference. It, is in wave motion, you know, the water attacks your detector. Whereas this is frozen in ice and nothing happens to it once it's there. It's not easy to put it in. But so what does this detector see? Uh, it sees uh, cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere and making pi zeros and pi ons. And these are not the ones we are interested in. They, they can be used to do very interesting physics, but they are not, they, they come from the atmosphere. And so in huge numbers, so I'll, uh, and of course, even if you look through the earth, you collect these neutrinos from everywhere uh, around the globe. And so this is a picture of the detector taking data. So what it does is whenever, it finds the right uh, collection of messages from the digital optical modules. It puts them in together, mostly in muon tracks, also in other things, as you will see later. You see this movie repeats. This movie is 10 milliseconds long. And so what that means is that we detect 3,000 cosmic ray muons every second, about 100 billion per year go on, on tape, we get 100,000 atmospheric neutrinos per year. These are still background, but they are interesting to do physics with. Uh, but then we discovered in this mess about 200 cosmic neutrinos. And those are the ones, of course, we were interested in. No, no, we reconstruct them and throw them away. Yeah, yeah. The, the, a muon is a muon. Nothing tells you whether it comes from, was made by an atmospheric neutrino directly in the atmosphere by a cosmic ray or, uh, yeah. Yeah, and of course, 
yet uh, it's it's a good question actually because it also means given the ratio, if you confuse a downgoing muon with an upgoing muon because your reconstruction messes up, you have no signal, right? So you have to get rid of the hundred billion, of course. Before I go into the physics uh, in, into the, and the astronomy, uh, of course, the question that I usually get at this point, how do you put photomultipliers a mile deep in ice? And that's the other thing, the other problem we have to solve. So when we built this detector, nobody knew it would actually work. And the first reason we didn't know it would work is whether the ice was good enough. You saw we can reconstruct neutrinos, so the ice is good enough. The ice is incredibly complicated, but that doesn't matter as soon as if you understand the optical properties, that's all that counts, whether it's complicated or simple, it's not. But the real reason this works is that the absorption length of, of Cherenkov light, in the, the, the ice comes in layers because they are made by snow accumulating on the South Pole and compacting. And so this snow is ultra pure. And so the absorption length for blue light at the top of the detector is 100 meters. And at the bottom, it's 250 meters. Now, there's only, as far as I know, the record for purifying water and get to 100 meter absorption length is a place in Ottawa, which I once visited. It's very complex. So you cannot make a substance or, or, or in, in the lab that has this absorption length. We didn't know that, we, pure luck. The second challenge was how you do you put these things in the ice, because we knew once you got them in the ice, they are frozen in a glacier actually. And so nothing happens to them. And you have a totally stable detector. So I will answer all these questions. We, sorry if you saw this movie yesterday. The top layer at the South Pole is, uh, is snow. So you first melt your way through the snow. And then you have this thing coming in that's called the hot water drill. And it's just a nozzle. And this nozzle put out hot water under pressure, boiling water, and it falls by gravity. And two days later, it's at 2,500 meters. Then you stop it and pull it out. So what you need is a five megawatt heating plant to, to supply this, uh, this nozzle. And that's what we did. So here you see, it's like a circus train, except it's on sleds. This is the drill tower. This contains the electronics running the drill. This is a two and a half kilometer hose. It's about that big. And in one shot, it brings uh, the hot water, it makes the hole to two and a half kilometers. This is the power plant. It's 40 car wash heaters. And uh, they are supplied by uh, turbines that are driven by usual diesel fuel. That's it. And once we knew what we were doing, it takes about one C-130 of diesel to drill one hole. In fact, in the end, we could do it for less. So here, after two days, this drill comes out, the tower moves to another place to drill another hole. But here, now this is a critical thing, ice is an insulator, so that water remains liquid for a you know, we, we drill the hole so that it stays liquid for at least 30 hours. And here you see the cable bringing the high voltage and the signals. And every 17 meters, you attach one of these sensors and then you have instrumented a kilometer and then you let it sink into to its depth, in the depth of the hole. And... Uh, so to physics now, and to make this simple, first I have to tell you, uh, you see this event again. 
Uh, we now reconstruct these events to 0 0.3 degrees. So that's what we do astronomy with. But we also see these events. And you see there's no mu on track. This is an electron or a tau neutrino, which we begin to be able to tell apart, uh, thanks to machine learning. And uh, we cannot reconstruct them very well, but we can measure their energy very well. And if the energy is high enough, it cannot be an atmospheric neutrino, and you have discovered the cosmic neutrino. So in 2013, this is how we discovered cosmic neutrinos. To do astronomy, we still had to get back to this. And this, to make a long story short, is this. So what you do is you measure uh, muon neutrinos. And so this is the number of neutrinos measured in 10 years, slightly less, nine point something, as a function of their energy. And you see, that's the threshold of the detector. It's about 100 GeV. Then the detector turns on. Here we are at TV neutrinos. Now you see the atmospheric flux. And at higher and higher energy, there are less and less background neutrinos. And by now, we have beautifully calibrated this experiment. We know how to extrapolate the flux. We can calculate it. We can measure it. And you see this excess, which is by now close to 10 sigma. And uh, those are the cosmic neutrinos. This is the, it's a flux of about 200 per year. So this is the comparison of the simulation of the experiment with the measurement. So we can simulate our experiment. So the flux I just showed you is this flux. This is 100 TeV. This is 1,000 TeV. So you fit this flux. That's it. And then I told you we discovered, actually, cosmic neutrinos with Nui and Tau. So this is the Nui and Tau flux. And you see it nicely agrees with the muon flux. And so for every, we get one neutrino for every flavor equally. And that is neutrinos oscillate. If they come to you from very far away sources, by the time they arrive, there are equal numbers of each flavor, which is what we find. Uh, we have been refining these measurements. And so we have by now measured this flux many, many times. And you know, theorists had uh, seen dips in the spectrum and breaks. When the statistics accumulate, all these interesting things went away. This is just the power law of e to the minus 2.5. And this is not a flux, it's the energy flux. Like I showed in my very first slide, it's the energy that these particles carry to your detector. And you notice that this keeps going, most of the energy is sitting here. And this energy keeps going up and up. It doesn't turn over. And that's the discovery of this huge flux that is actually larger than the photon flux that's measured in the universe at gamma ray energies. And uh, so we are very work. Of course, this cannot go on forever, right? It's already uh, difficult to, to absorb. What, how, how protons and neutrinos suddenly dominate the sky over light. And so we are, you know, this is where your systematics becomes hard. And we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we are working on that. Here is another measurement, which I just, because many of you are particle physicists, this is one event. And what you measure is the flux times the cross section, right? you count events. In this case of this event, we exactly know the cross section because this event is this event. And what it is, it's an electron antineutrino that doesn't hit the nucleus. It interacts with an atomic electron in the ice. It makes a W, which decays into two jets. And we can do everything, you know, CMS does, but not as refined. We can see the jets in the muons. We can see the electromagnetic energy in the jet. And the energy of the event 
is 6.32 PEV, 6,320 TeV. And that's the mass of the W in the lab frame. And so for us, this was incredibly exciting because this meant that we really understood energy. So it, the event is calibrated. But because you know the cross-section of standard model physics, we now know the flux from this one event, and that's what you saw on the plot. So uh, this is all going very well until we realize that uh, there is a problem. That is that, okay, this is the universe in light. You go out, not in Minneapolis, but somewhere else, you see the Milky Way. And this is the gamma ray sky in GEV, and you see our own galaxy, and then you see these dots that are other galaxies. And it's simple geometry that you have to, there are neutrino sources, we don't know what there are, but whatever they are, you have to see the ones in your own galaxy first. And that's true in every wavelength of light, right? You see the Milky Way, and then the rest is behind it. And here are, is a map of some analysis of neutrinos. This map is totally uniform. There's no Milky Way. And so, you know, what do you do with this? And uh, because are you doing something wrong? Re remember, this is a unique experiment. Nobody else is checking this. There is no CMS and Atlas. And so, you know, you don't sleep at night, right? Uh, we finally detected the Milky Way. This is a cartoon, but these red clouds are neutrinos. And they are made by protons that wander around the galaxy. They hit hydrogen in the galactic plane and make pions and neutrinos. And we see exactly what Fermi sees, except that 10 TeV energy instead of the GeV energy. And it dominates the sky. There's, we are not sure there's any room for seeing for a flux from the sources that produces these cosmic rays. So the cosmic ray, the sources in our galaxy are still a total mystery. And of course, this is now a new method anyway to look for them. So that's our next frontier. But so uh, you can see here, uh, I won't explain this, but you see here the sky in GeV, gamma rays and in neutrinos. And you know, it just, you see the same things. Okay, so one remark about this. Remember the cosmic ray puzzle? One way to explain, so if you don't see the Milky Way, in fact, it's there at 10% level of the extra galactic flux. If you take that number, it means that 90% of your flux come from other galaxies that are much farther. So that means that there are neutrino sources in other galaxies that don't exist in your own galaxy. The obvious guess is it's the black hole. If a galaxy has an active black hole, it will accelerate particles, they will interact, and uh, our black hole is not active. And from this 10% number, you can derive that the black hole cannot have been active in the last 1 million years, which is kind of the same limits that astronomers are setting on, uh, on this number from other considerations. Next question, where are these gamma rays? And that turns out to be a very interesting question. Because remember, these gamma rays, they stop and make an electron positron pair. But what they actually do is these electron positron will radiate, the fate photons will pair produce. You make an electromagnetic shower. And in the energy range of our neutrinos, typically these uh, photons will end up, after propagating to Earth in the microwave background, they will end up at tennis GV. And there is a satellite, a Fermi satellite, that uh, detects such particles. And here you can see the comparison, right? This is the flux uh, that I already showed. And you see our flux measurement exceeding uh, 
the photon flux. In fact, you can do this very carefully and without going too much detail. If you actually take this measurement of the neutrino spectrum, I calculate the gamma ray spectrum, one gamma ray per neutrino, twice the energy. I dump them in the microwave background. There's no theory here, straightforward calculation. I actually obtain more 10 GeV gamma rays than Fermi sees. Now, you say, well, your experiment is wrong. No, it's, it's, it's very simple. Uh, it means that the target in which you produce the neutrinos is dense enough that the gamma rays already start losing energy in the target, even before they reach the microwave background. And so the present idea is that they come out at MEV, where there are no telescopes, or below, at X-rays. And remember this, as gamma rays don't tell you anything about neutrino sources in this case, we are going to look at the next best thing, which is X-rays, to try to point us at sources of cosmic rays in the sky. And this has been very successful. So uh, that's our uh, conclusions at this point. I think I said all that. So then the next question is, where do they come from? And uh, we, for about six years, we did anything possible to try to find, you know, sources of neutrinos. We couldn't find anything in, the diff the, in this diffuse sky. If you want to know what you're up against, this is a year of data. There are 138,000 neutrinos. These are really neutrinos, 97% purity. There are no cosmic muons in this. And uh, so you have to find 200 cosmic neutrinos, and then you have to try to find where they come from in this source. And that's what we do, actually. And I only showed you one year, not 10 years. Uh, in fact, this is one of the sources we we have evidence for, it's not the strongest. You see the red are the neutrinos from the source, the blue is the background. But if I don't color the red dots, you don't see anything, right? So we have a method that I won't go into to extract clusters of neutrinos. And the beauty of the method is, so you look for clusters that have on, on average higher energy. And so you search the whole sky, and with this method, you know exactly what your statistics is. So uh, it's called the maximum likelihood method, uh, but uh, I won't dwell on it. After 10 years of data, we analyzed the sky, and we found four sources that were reaching the five sigma level. But then, of course, this is before you count all the trials for scanning the whole sky. And then if you take those into account, then this source, NGC 1068, had a significance of 2.9 sigma. Now, this is 10 years of data. So you are not going to wait another 50 years for this to become 5 sigma. The only choice you have is to go back to your experiment. And so we did several things. I listed them here. We improved the detector geometry. We calibrated, recalibrated every photomultiplier individually and positioned them. We actually took into account which way they pointed after they refroze. Some of them are not quite vertical anymore. Uh, we knew more about the optics of the ice now. Uh, we use neural nets instead of cut and count method to reconstruct the energy and the direction of the neutrinos. And uh, there is a, a critical quantity. You see, this is a, a neutrino that comes from this direction. You reconstruct it, it has a width, a resolution of about 0.2 degrees. But we fitted this with a Gaussian, 
and you see it doesn't work. Uh, this distribution of neutrinos around the source has very long tails. And so you say, well, that's good. If you make it Gaussian, your experiment is better. No, that's not true. You have to have the point spec function of your telescope. It has to be right. If you overestimate or underestimate, it doesn't matter. You lose sensitivity. You're partially blind. And this was a big deal. And we could do this because we have a, really, we can simulate our data. So we applied all this, not just to the data we were taking. We have all our archival data on, on disk and on tape. And so we reran 10 years of data with these improved uh, calibration and analysis tools. And so there was this uh, NGC 1068 jumped from uh, 2.9 to 4.2 sigma. But remember this 4.2 sigma accounting for all the trials. So you don't need five sigma. The other thing is actually, if you define this as a local excess, it's above five sigma. That's what you do in astronomy. So uh, I don't think there's any doubt that we've seen this source. And so you see here uh, the background, and then this is one degree. And then when you come, you see here the excess, and uh, we can simulate this observation perfectly. So this is a 0.3 degree resolution. So 81 neutrinos from this source. Uh, we had also a list of 100 sources that we decided on a long time ago, the gamma ray sources. So we were actually looking now, we know at the wrong sources. Uh, but it didn't matter. In this list of sources, again, this source popped out as the most significant one. And you see here with a 5.3, sorry, excess in the sky. So, uh, hmm, one second. Then we uh, started, we, we realized, I'll tell you in a minute what happening in NGC 1068. Let's try to look at X-ray sources instead of gamma ray sources, because the gamma ray sources, you know, we have no astronomy to reveal which are the good gamma ray sources. And so uh, the X-ray sources, we instantly uh, found evidence for NGC 4151. Now for the astronomers in the audience, this is interesting. These are the two galaxies that's most luminous galaxies that Seifert found in 1943. And uh, so we are the same galaxies. Then we ask the question, uh, it's, you ask a binomial question, which are the highest energy sources in the sky? If you pick two sources, which are the two highest energy ones? If you pick three sources, which are the two highest energy ones. And in fact, the biggest probability came if you pick three sources. And these were the three sources. Again, NGC 1068, PKS 1424. They're all the same active galaxies. I mean, it becomes boring at five, right? <laughs> and, but this one is TXS of 506. This, so that source, we had discovered two years before. And so it was here again. And the way we discovered, I mean, I told you for six years, we couldn't find any structure in the sky map. So what we did is whenever you find a neutrino event, the computers at the pole reconstruct the direction where they come from. Normally, those data is sent to Madison, further analyzed and then sent to the collaboration. In this case, we just send the coordinates to the rest of the world in an astronomical telegram. So 43 seconds after, you could, after uh, the light went through the ice, you could see on this on your computer everywhere in the world. And so you could look in the point your telescope in the direction of this neutrino. We didn't know if anyone paid attention to this. But it turns out 
that this, this neutrino came from an active galaxy. And this active galaxy was actually flaring in gamma rays. And uh, so the probability for this to happen with the precision of uh, a reconstruction is like one in a thousand. What made this event real is that the source was also, uh, happens to also be a TV source. And that's even more rare. And we found out whether people looked at our alerts, there were more than 20 telescopes that looked in the direction of this neutrino. And we only found out much later that one Russian robotic telescope master looked at the source 73 seconds after we sent the alert. So it was right on the source. And what it did is, it found an optical flash two hours after the neutrino. So they didn't publish this because they were afraid, you know, this is our telescope. The source maybe does this regularly. They had looked at it before and never seen this. So they looked at the source continuously for two years and never saw anything again. It didn't do anything. The only thing it did was two hours. And that's, of course, multi-messenger astronomy in the time domain, right? So uh, we also found it in our own data. This is nine years of data. This is what I've been talking about. This is what we found in our own data in 2014, three years earlier. We knew this was there. It's in a thesis of the University of Geneva. But after you are through with all the trials, uh, you cannot really, you couldn't claim this and we didn't. Okay, so I told you the story of the master telescope. I, so, but this source, as I said, we had seen before and it reappeared in our analysis. So now I will, you know, if you put a gun on my head and said, what do you think are the sources of cosmic rays now? And I will tell you what they are. It, it, may or may not be true. But let's concentrate on NGC 1068. So this is again the flux, the energy flux, E squared times the flux, as a function of energy. So we detect neutrinos in the 10 to, in, in the TV range to 10 TV range. And the interesting thing on this plot, here are theorists fitting this data, but the interesting thing in this plot is that telescopes looked for the gamma rays. In fact, it, they, they had actually looked at this source. This is a gamma ray telescope in the Canary Islands, and there are no photons. So again, the photons are missing. And I have already introduced the concept, right, that uh, this is the... Uh, that somehow the cosmic rays are accelerate falling into the black hole, either in shocks or in the turbulent field in the accretion disk. There are many ways to accelerate cosmic rays. And then they, you have this dense X-ray corona and also the density of hydro of gas in this region is very large. And so you just can fit a neutrino data insist that the gamma rays don't get out. And from these two facts, you can determine the density of target where the neutrinos are produced. If you go too far from the black hole, the gamma rays get out and you violate these limits. If you get too close, you produce too many neutrinos. So the answer is that the neutrinos are produced at a... Uh, uh, Schwarzschild radii. And so, I think I explained all this to you. So what's Stan Schwarzschild radii? So when all, all the theorists were looking for production in the jets, they had nothing to do with that. It all comes from close to the black hole. You all know this picture. This is one and a half Schwarzschild radius. So now we have our dream come true. We see neutrinos from a place where astronomers cannot go, right? The problem is we have only 81 neutrinos. So if for this to become really interesting, 
uh, we have to, and by the way, all the sources we see are in, in this category. So that's what I would bet my money on of what produces the cosmic rays. Uh, we are not finished. Uh, so what, I am finished actually. So the obvious thing we need is more neutrinos with better angle resolution. And we know how to do this. My talk is over, I won't explain it to you. But, uh, and many other telescopes, of course, China is already has plans for three neutrino telescopes. One, not just bigger than ice cube, but bigger than the bigger ice cube, which is 10 times ice cube. So they, they are, have plans to build 30 times ice cube detector. And this is the type of thing, you know, where you will need to do real astronomy. So I think we have finally, that's my conclusion. We have discovered the tools to solve the cosmic ray problem. Even if you don't buy my story, it doesn't matter. Thank you. As I said yesterday in my public lecture, this is how I like to show the Ice Cube collaboration. And look at all these young people who forced us to use machine learning and were right. <laughs> None of what you saw today would have been possible without, you know, the latest fancy neural nets that appeared about two years ago. Patience, please. No, we don't know. We know where the neutrinos come from. They come from interactions of cosmic rays with, with the one proton per cubic centimeter. And we don't know where the cosmic rays originate. Yeah. No, they are produced in our galaxy, but not by sources. Okay, so the way to think of this, there are sources we don't know about. They produce cosmic rays. These cosmic rays, they wander for about a million years. They are trapped in our galaxy. Each time they cross the disk, they give an opportunity to hit a hydrogen or whatever and produce a pi on a neutrino. That's what we see. That's what Fermi sees. See, we see the same thing. And from our measurement, it looks like that's the dominant contribution. So where the neutrinos, the cosmic rays are produced, that it doesn't tell us this. And in fact, to the extent that it saturates our neutrino flux, we think there is no room for neutrinos from sources, so they will be hard to find. You know, uh, so if you want to get depressed, one possibility is that you never find these sources, that they produced the neutrinos a million, two million, three million years ago, and they are not there anymore. They are there, but they are totally un uninteresting. You will, they will never get your attention. I'm not saying this is true, but, but we are looking. Yeah. So this is a new round of looking for sources using, because here, of course, there is no question of absorption. Uh, our galaxy is transparent to gamma rays. So Fermi sees the gamma rays that we see uh, or correspond to our neutrinos. How do you measure energy of the particles? Pardon? How do you measure total energy of your events? Ah, yeah, I never told you that. I, uh, the, a muon, what a, uh, what a muon does, in fact, we don't really reconstruct the Sherenkov cone either. If you want a true story, this muon loses energy catastrophically when it moves through the ice. What that means is it will radiate, it will pair produce, it will interact by deep inelastic scattering. And so when you look at a muon in detail, uh, you look at all the photons and the time of the event, what you see is a series of showers produced each time the muon loses energy. And in fact, 
when you connect these showers, you get a better measurement of the direction than from the Sherenkov cone. So you, of course, you use everything. Uh, but then this catastrophic energy loss uh, tells you what the energy is. Yeah, I didn't, I mean, if I explain everything, I'm here until tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I gave this talk the first time at Fermilab, they said, every muon is the same. How do you know the energy? I said, yes, your muon, they're all the same. <laughs> this was before the LHC. <laughs> Now the LHC people know about uh, catastrophic energy loss. Yes. I hope so. Uh, I think the water experiments, they, we ran for 10 years, we ran a small experiment developing this technique, which was called Amanda. And we developed technique by, uh, by proving we could detect neutrinos from, uh, cos uh, not from the cosmos, but from, from the atmosphere. And so they are at a stage where they have built such an experiment and operated for 15 years. In fact, uh, in a few weeks, they are uh, retiring the experiment. There is a ceremony. Uh, and they have started building a detector uh, unfortunately, the detect well, it will be all, it will be the size of ice cube, which is good. But uh, you know, I think it's the time to to build ten times ice cube, and that's what the Chinese are are targeting. Uh, there are also there is a, a development to build an ice cube type telescope in Canada, off the coast of Vancouver, and uh, there are a variety of other ideas. But uh, yeah, I mean, they, it's more difficult, but it's not impossible. I mean, it, it has been demonstrated to the point that we had demonstrated technique when we, we started building ISQ. Yeah, I think we need, as I said on my slide, more and better telescopes. Well, if I knew the answer to that, I would have solved the cosmic ray problem, right? Uh, in fact, if my answer is correct, the ideal telescope is uh, MEV satellite. And, and the gamma ray community knows that. They, you know, they are not going to build a bigger or better Fermi. They want to build MEV satellites. And they're, of course, the reason we don't have MEV detectors is because it's very hard, right? We know the diffuse MEV. Actually, uh, if you look at our diffuse flux and you take the model of NGC 1068, it actually saturates the observed MEV diffuse background light. Uh, but now we need a detector that can detect sources. And uh, I don't know, you know, they're trying very hard, but this is not really what NASA wants to do, right? I don't know. The, the atmospheric, well, you saw the flux, right? No, the atmospheric neutrinos, they reach Okay, so the way to think about it is uh, they are a background, right? When you reach 300 TeV and you see a neutrino of 300 TeV, the chances that it's atmospheric or cosmic is 50-50. If you are above that quickly, the chances is atmospheric become very low. If you go below, they are most likely atmospheric. But you know, as uh, what it's a statistical statement, right? Because you every muon is a muon. Some have high energy, some low energy. 
but they don't tell you where they come from, right? The energy tells you the probability that they're background or signal. No, you, uh, they, the neutrinos, the way you have to think about it, the neutrino source is like a star, right? It's totally, it radiates in neutrinos in all directions. We, we just point it back. You know, when you see a star in the sky, it, it, it radiates light in all directions. You, you catch the photons that come to your eye. So that's how you have to think about it. So, uh, of course, it's different when if neutrinos were produced in a jet, then then uh, it has uh, direct. It they come in a certain direction. Yes, go ahead. Oh, better neutrino means better angular resolution, better energy measurement, better everything. Uh, I didn't talk about this, but the particle physicists are very interested in the measurement of the different flavors. And so better also means being better at telling electron from tau neutrinos. So, uh, yeah, better means a lot of things, not, not just more neutrinos. Wait, I, there's some noise. Can you, can you repeat the question? What do you mean by fluctuations? Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's when uh, statistical fluctuations. You know, you look at a hundred sources, right? We saw four at five sigma. And uh, then you have made a lot of trials. You don't know whether this is a statistical fluctuation or or whether these are four real sources. So yeah, I meant statistical fluctuations. Okay, so like for weak neutrino events, do we have is there a threshold to distinguish these two things? Well, yeah, it, uh, I, the, I didn't go into detail, in, but the the typical threshold you require is five sigma, right? And uh, but we don't do it that way. We count all our trials, and then you can actually calculate the probability that uh, observation can be accidental, and that uh, is less than one in a hundred thousand for for the sources for the for NGC thousand sixty eight. Thank you. Yeah, statistics is. Uh, I usually stay away from this. <laughs> All right. If statistics, he was Rutherford, right? If statistics matters, does it do a better experiment? I do, it was Rutherford, yeah. Any last pressing question? If not, then let's thank Francis again. Thank you. Uh, there is a refreshments and coffee outside. <laughs>